I'm Gab Pesquera from Invera. For the past eight years, I've worked with building controls. And the thing that's frustrated me is how we fail to deliver for the people inside commercial buildings. So our airside systems can't get you the right temperature you want needed, which is why you're freezing at times and why you're sweating at times. Hold on one second. Can you hear him back? No, hear him back. All right. Step a little bit closer to that microphone. There you go. All right, I'm going to stay right here. All right. So the, the central issue uh, is actually that these systems don't really respond to changes in occupancy well. And this problem has been documented as an $11 billion problem in the US alone. But the bigger problem goes back to you not being happy in your office or your classroom, right? The impact on your quality of life, on your productivity, uh, in terms of comfort is really the hair on fire problem and, and the frustration people find with their workplace. As you can see, you know, you've probably experienced it, but uh, so do the majority of people. So when we talk about occupancy and you talk about basically air conditioning systems, so that pushing air to you in your room, there's three things that we're really solving for. One, underutilized space gets overserved and, and it really run based on assumptions. Um, two, when rooms like this fill up, trust me, in 30 minutes it's going to be much warmer in here and that's no good. So think about that crowded meeting room. And three, the air handler that serves multi-zone, that's really what we're focused on, multi-zone systems, is really not delivering for the hottest and the coldest zone. It's really just trying to find a middle ground that doesn't quite work. So our sort of comfort as a service is really pinned around the algorithms we've developed to optimize both at the air handler level and at the zone level, right? So we take into account air quality, temperature control, and of course, energy consumption. If you think about how we go to market, there's really two segments that are, are two product lines that we're focused on. Both of these are multi-zone system variable air volume. One on the right uh, is a standalone uh, building automation system that we have. Um, and that's a $3 billion market for our sort of ongoing software service um, in the US alone. And two, we latch on to existing uh, building automation systems. So, let me just step back and, and say something. From, from selling to commercial real estate, the biggest issue for any startup in this space is really sales cycle. And I know that a lot of people in here can probably empathize with that. So we've developed a way of getting, basically starting with just one room or one floor, a very low barrier of entry model for the web-based system and focusing on tenants and contractors who serve those tenants to provide lightweight building automation systems in a multi-tenant commercial building. So again, trying to get that sales cycle to a month um, in order to make this really scalable. So for the web-based system, how do we get up and running so fast? Well, we actually integrate in a way that nobody else does, just directly through the internet. So no hardware installation for that. Um, again, we use sort of our, our way to measure occupancy and predict um, changes in load around occupancy to optimize the system, and we get a less than one year payback on that model. But the reason why we see kind of the faster sales cycle is when people are really buying to make sure that people aren't freezing or too hot. Similarly, uh, same sort of value prop, a little bit more cost of front, which we're trying to more and more amortize, um, is basically a standalone building automation system, a lightweight one, uh, far cheaper than what the big OEMs offer right now with our uh, proprietary advanced control software. So just the first case study I want to run through, uh, full disclosure, this building's owned by BMW. That's an investor of ours. So we kind of got an easy test bed there uh, starting in August. We showed an immediate reduction in energy consumption. We maintained a really high level of air quality. And most importantly, people weren't freezing their asses off in the middle of summer. So, Again, our, our algorithms take air conditioning sensor data, turn that into occupancy estimates in a, in a unique and proprietary way. We then use that to take what was a hodgepodge cooling load that was all over the map and then really focus it when it's needed, when there's actually people in the room and, and depending on how many people are in the room. So you can see that change in terms of a lot of cooling all the time and then kind of these little focus bits. Uh, air quality. Uh, Basically, it was, it was pretty solid before because they were over-ventilating the hell out of the, uh, the building. We maintain that. We don't compromise that. 
Um, and I love this. So I was trying to get feedback, and I thought, oh, you know, how are people doing? Um, as you can see, Liz was living under the tyranny of an HVAC system that dictated her wardrobe. Um, and, you know, it's funny, but it's not funny when, you know, people are pulling up space heaters and, and, and whatnot. And it really is so, such an epidemic in these multi-zone systems. So I want to just step back and, and something kind of we found. I know we're all energy efficiency, clean tech people, but um, understanding how space is used, which is sort of a byproduct of our system, uh, is really interesting, particularly for the Fortune 500s. So they only use about 60% of their real estate. Um, using less will save them money on rent and also energy. Um, so Gensler reached out to us because they're like, hey, you guys are crazy. You're measuring the number of people in a room based on air sensor data. Uh, we want to test it out. And what we showed is that we were actually within an average of 0.82 of seat sensors, which are pretty reliable. Every occupancy measurement technology has its issues, which we can talk about. Um, so based on that, they're including us in a technology review that I can share with all of you, if you'd like, uh, that's coming out next week about different technologies just to measure the number of people in a room. Um, moving forward, um, one minute. Um, so for the standalone building automation system, we've got a 30,000 square foot uh, tenant in Midtown Manhattan that's rolling our system out in January. So we've, we've got the products ready and we're sort of building out our pipeline. And as we're doing that, it's a good trigger point to engage, particularly with angel investors. So if you're an angel, uh, please come talk to me. Um, and yeah. So in terms of team, Stephen and I are kind of the core members, founders. Um, Steven, his background is as a software engineer, uh, building large-scale projects. I'm a mechanical engineer. I've worked at software companies that mine building management system data. Um, thank you. There's a lag here by the time it kicks in, so thank you. Uh, bunch of questions, but let me just ask you this. Uh, assuming it works as represented, walk me through the sales cycle from start to finish, and tell me where the friction is. Okay, this is an excellent question. So what we're really looking at is, for our early sales, a focus on tenant and contractors who sell to tenant, right? So we're trying to find people who are frustrated with too hot, too cold. Um, once we have that initial meeting, I would say um, maybe the biggest friction, to be honest, is uh, the fact that we're offering guarantees around temperature control and maintaining a certain range. Um, it's sort of novel, and so getting legal involved. Because everybody who suffers the problem, you know, it's a high priority, but then you get to legal, and they're sort of like, we've got a ton of stuff on our plate. Um, so that's, and that goes back to my previous experience in this space too. So I think getting something that's a little different approved is probably, the, that's probably the slowest part. Generating a proposal for us takes a day, two days. How are you structuring the license fees? It's a great question. Um, so you, you notice there was two models. Um, on, on a high level, uh, you've got a model that's a little bit more expensive for standalone building automation system. Uh, ongoing fee, and then you've got a lower fee if you're just doing on top of a web-based system. Um, so that's a percent per square foot per year model for both. Um, and again, uh, for the standalone, there's a hard, there is a hardware component, I have to say, and so we're trying to figure out how do we get that upfront lower and lower because, again, friction, right? Um, I have. I guess I'm getting a little bit of a mixed message. Um, you're, it sounds like you've got two, um, I don't know if they're value propositions, but you're, you're talking about controlling the environment to make the consumer more comfortable, the, the, the tenants, tenant, so to speak, uh, in a building. Uh, but what is, you also have this energy savings component. Uh, so when you're talking to either the, the tenants or the contractors, what are you leading with? That's a great question. So we start by saying we're controlling temperature right, and, the pro and this whole thing will pay for itself in less than two years with the energy savings. And then when they look at the actual contract, they're looking way closer at the temperature control than they are at the 
at the energy cost savings. The energy cost savings satisfies the CFO, but the push is coming from the office manager and the operational person who's getting all the complaints. <laughs> Microphones aren't your thing today. <laughs> How does the web-based BMS track occupancy and comfort in the absence of sensors and controls? And then how are you ensuring that what you're changing within the building BMS is actually making the appropriate changes in a particular room or office? Okay, so... Yeah, 15 seconds to answer. <laughs> uh, good follow -up for me. Air quality is important. Sometimes we add wireless sensors. We're the only people with, you know, that are basically doing battery-powered CO2 sensors. We also have a fully web-based with no additional sensors, but they're just diminishing returns. Um, so again, that's going back to figuring out the lowest barrier of entry. Uh, the second question uh, was how do we measure? So we either through the existing system or through whatever we put in, we we're collecting data and we're assiduously measuring impact on the change in how much cooling or heating is being delivered and which goes back to energy and the actual temperature control performance. So that's you know, and people love getting monthly reports for some reason, so we're generating that even though there's a freaking dashboard. That's a whole other story. <laughs> All right. Good. Thank you, Gab. Well done. Thank you. Thank you.